thinking about it. Hi everyone, hope you're all well. I'm Nikki and this evening I'd like to introduce to you Fergus Coots. He is a vet in Scotland and specialises in pain management. So we're going to have a chat to him this evening about his work. Um, so I'm, as a GP vet, I see a lot of arthritic cases and some of them can be quite challenging. And with lots of conditions, when they do become a bit complicated or quite challenging, we end up referring them to a specialist or we speak to a specialist about what we can do. So for arthritis, our specialists that we would refer to would be lovely pain specialists like Fergus. So with that, I'm just going to ask him to introduce himself and give us a little bit of information about what he does. Um, and we will answer any questions uh, if we can as we go on. Uh, so please do comment. Please do ask us questions. Um, we'll get started. Fergus, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, I'm Fergus Coots and I graduated from Edinburgh in 1981. Um, after about 30 years in general practice, uh, I started getting interested in pain management and uh, here we are. So I work across Scotland in Stirling, Aberdeen, Inverness, and also some work in Gurick. So I cover all four corners of Scotland. Great. And um, so you um, have been working today, haven't you? Yes. Doing that today. Uh, so one of the things that we get asked quite a lot on our um, Facebook page or group called Holly's Army, which is where client, uh, dog owners will message in, share stories, uh, ask questions to get advice from other people in the group. And we get lots of questions on there about how you go about getting a referral to a pain specialist. How do you approach your vet? Can you do it directly? So give us a little bit of information about how you like to get your referrals. Uh, I think all referrals, whichever subjects it's in, they always work best when it's a three-way conversation. So I always ask, if I do get approached directly, my first advice is to go back and speak to your usual vet. Um, just run through the treatment that the dog's on or the cat's on. Make sure that you're happy with um, the treatment it's getting. They can also then have a review of the case. They might suggest make suggestions before referral or they might say, yep, yeah, sure, off you go and, and make the referral for them. So, but it does have to come from the vet. Referral should come from the vet. Okay. Um, when you when you then speak to the vet, um, if there is more information that you need, do you get them to do that first or are you sort of looking at these animals and bringing them in to work them up, doing the x-rays and bloods and things like that? Or A bit of both. We'll usually, um, if I see something uh, which, which needs doing, I'll refer back to the, the referring vet and ask them to, to take the further x-rays or blood sampling, also monitoring blood samples. We, we work very closely with the referring vets for that. Um, sometimes if they come in and they need further work with other disciplines, then I'll send them on to the orthopedic team or neurologists or cardiologists, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so it really depends. Each case is different yeah what kind of cases do you see are they a lot of arthritis cases that I come your way yeah the majority is going to be the majority of the dogs are do have osteoarthritis and it's usually cases where they've been treated by their uh, referring vets with the licensed products and things aren't going as well as they could do and mm. um, there's a few dogs coming in with other illnesses which mean they can't take the usual drugs um, so if they've got heart disease, for example, or if they've got kidney problems, um, or if they've been unable to take the usual medicines, if it made them feel sick, um, yeah. or if it's diarrhea, then, then there's that. We're also getting sort of post-surgical pain, um, where animals have had operations and then end up with, with surgical pain afterwards. And that's a big field, in, in emerging field in human medicine. And it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's an emerging field in, in, our, in our group anyway yeah um and palliative care actually that's another thing that's starting to become more common with with animals having treatment for serious uh what cancer disease and this sort of thing and um, sometimes they end up with pain uh, like with bone tumors that kind of thing as yeah. well we see a lot of those yeah. Yeah. yeah so what age groups are you commonly seeing do you are you are you surprised at sometimes how young these um arthritic animals are that are coming to you or it tends yeah, to be the older ones. What tends to happen, there's probably two distinct groups, which is you'll recognize as well. 
with the um, quite a few long um, younger dogs will end up with arthritis in in the, the elbows, for example, or in the hips, mm -hmm. and through a malformation or hip dysplasia, for example, or elbow dysplasia. And mm -hmm. if it's affecting one leg more than the other, so when the dog's walking, it's limping, then they come in at an earlier age. Mm -hmm. A second group will be affected in both elbows equally and so instead of limping from one side to the other they just have a short gait yeah yeah time. and so those animals tend those dogs tend to come in when they're about seven or eight years old yeah but there are there's a few dogs we get where they're only really just turn a year and mm -hmm. um, they've got hip problems or, or elbow problems so that's a, it's a real challenge but it's actually the best time isn't it because some of those um i, I mean i see cases sometimes where I'm surprised at how they're walking and it looks really abnormal, but the owners actually, because they've always been that way, because it's been a hip dysplasia and they've just sort of grown up watching them walk that way, they don't actually recognise that it's a, an issue. Yeah. Um, and if they do recognise it's an issue early on, then that's the best time because there's a lot more that can be done, even if it's non-surgical, with management and, and pain relief, isn't there? So it's great if you can see them younger. Yeah, yeah, bringing pain under control before it becomes a problem. Yeah, I know, I know from a behavioural point of view, which I, I'm I'm sure we'll come on to talk about later. But one of the mm -hmm. things is that um, one of the behaviourists I spoke to last year was saying that he thinks younger younger dogs show more pain. Um, okay. Dogs, uh, his view was that they've actually learnt to adapt to it. Yeah. Which, yeah. From a welfare point of view, you think well, actually, that you know, it's an un undiagnosed welfare problem. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so with the arthritic dogs that come to you, what would you say uh, are the owner's biggest concerns and why have they, has, why has it been flagged up in the first place that they're concerned about their, their dog's mobility, uh, demeanour, appetite, whatever? What, what do you find are the most common symptoms that owners are worried about? Probably all of that, but one of the first questions, actually, it's, it's an interesting point because one of the first questions I always ask people is, you know, what's your main concern? It might sound mm -hmm. a silly question when you come into a pain clinic, but what is your main concern? And everyone asks, answers rather, what, it's always quality of life. Right. So it's getting the quality of the life back. Now, for a young dog, that might mean that they want, the, well, they like, like the dog to be able to you know enjoy walks through the forests uh, an older dog it might be you know 12 13 year old dog for example it might be that they want the dog to be able to enjoy a plod through the, the trees without necessarily doing five miles through the forest yeah yeah so just getting that sort of um getting that uh, that balance i suppose yeah so I suppose, you know, the questions that they're they're asking about um there's obvious things like lameness i suppose that would be an obvious thing the reason for coming in um, if they're stiff after they've been for a walk, or stiff if they're rising, if they've been resting. Yeah. Uh, plodding, plodding behind, you know, and looking for shortcuts. That's another thing sometimes owners report is they're going around the park and the dog knows that if it cuts left before the pond, it's going to miss half a mile. Yeah. They're not dark, are they? No, no, they're doing it because they really don't want to, they don't want to be there. Um, and do you find, um, that when owners uh when you start asking them questions uh, that do you have some sort of questionnaire that you go through with them and then they go oh gosh yeah no i've noticed that as well and yeah now you come to mention it i have they, they are they are eating in in a weird way or different times of the day do you find that a lot of those other flags that we know about come up when you start talking about it yes so things one of the questions is how does the dog sleep oh he's up and down all night uh, mm. that's always a red flag um yeah. what else um noise sometimes dogs get noise sensitivity uh, yes in pain uh, that's another thing that i know you spoke to daniel mills um was it three weeks ago uh, yeah a few weeks ago yeah a lot of work coming out from lincoln about the role of noise sensitivity yeah um and also aggression we've had some dogs referred from the, the table and sixty percent of the behaviourist caseload is supposed to is is related to pain. Yeah, is that high? Is it? So they say, yeah. Yeah. And so we tend to get, you know, we, I do get referrals of dogs with, uh, you know, being aggressive, and 
get the pain under control and you know, not all of them by any means but some of them their behavior can improve dramatically yeah do much better yeah we were talking about this yesterday actually with one of my clients we were talking about the acupuncture and she was asking me um she'd read about acupuncture helping with some of those noise anxieties and I said that I felt that's because some of those anxiety, some of those reactions they have were because when they get anxious, when they show the behaviors of being anxious, it actually causes pain. So that's how the acupuncture is sometimes helping is because, or any pain relief is helping because it's stopping them from being painful and then they're not making that association. So I guess that's quite, quite true. And also it's gonna show up a lot more in the next couple of months with fireworks and, you know, the, the weather yeah, changes absolutely. and things. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so when you uh, have somebody first come in, you obviously get all your information from the referring vet and they will send, I guess they'll send blood results and x-rays, yes. uh, all the medications that they've, they've been on so far. And um, so what do you like to get from your owners when they first come in? What do you what do you like them to bring with them? Obviously they bring their dog or, or their cat. Um, what, are, what other information are you looking for from them? Um, just really first off with just, I asked them just an open question, you know, just talk, you know, speak to me about how your dog is and, and what you've noticed. And as we mentioned before, what would you like to see? But really just mm. addressing all their concerns and sometimes that part can be 15, 20 minutes, um, mm. especially with, you know, some of the, the older dogs. Um, yeah, it can be very, very, uh, very informative just listening to what owners have to say. They, they know the dog better than anyone else. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then really after that, we just go through the, the questionnaire and just try and get to get to grips. But it's also um, what can happen is that uh, sometimes the questions afterwards people will, will email back in and, and they might have observations that the questions have triggered a thought on the way home yeah yeah i totally agree we get this yeah and then do you uh, do you do your physical examination or do you then take them outside and watch them walk or how do you how do you go then what yeah, do you like to see i like to see them walking first well we get them to walk and then trot and as you know it's quite difficult with noisy roads fire engines going by that sort of thing it can be difficult yeah. to get them to concentrate and also another thing is where um at, at all the surgeries i work where, where the dog would be walking up and down other dogs have been you know uh, urinating there so, so yeah males are distracting as well so i quite like owners to take video at home actually yeah see walking around in the park or in the field um just see how it walks in its in its normal environment mm-hmm yeah and after that then i know where, where to concentrate on the physical exam and just so for, for people that are thinking about oh yes i need to take some videos here how um so for me when i like to see a video i like to see them walking from behind and then i like to see them sort of walk past as well from the side yeah how do, what would you uh, just for if anyone is thinking oh yeah i'm going to do this the next time i go to the vets i'm going to take a video with me First of all, they need to be walking, I guess, is the most useful thing to start with. Yes. And then would you agree that you need to see it from all sides of the animal? Yeah, I like to watch from behind as well, uh, just to have a look at the way that the, the gates, well, I suppose I'm from the front. Um, and then, but then also walking from left to right, right to left, and towards the camera and away from the camera, and also trotting. Yeah. Do you ever ask them to walk in circles and just assess how how well balanced they are or is that uh i will will at the, at the examination but not not on the videos no. not just on the video okay and then with your physical exam then you're just going to start do a sort of head to tail examination absolutely um and what are you looking for in particular you're looking for swelling pain what 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 kind of things um, would you tell the owner about Anything really, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, for example, we start with the teeth, you know, there's some dogs come in and they got fractured teeth. Mm. Uh, fractured teeth are not making the dog lame, but they are contributing to the overall pain burden of the animal. So I think if you can re relieve that, then, then um, it would improve the, the quality of life. But just as, as you said, you start at the front, work all the way back, have mm. a good feel of all the joints, look for bony swellings, um, joint capsule swellings. Um, try and get an area, an idea for the range of movement in the joint. Um, I don't 
usually squeeze joints till they hurt. Uh, there's yeah. no point in doing that. If the joint, if an elbow is obviously swollen, um, I can feel that. And if the dog's laying yeah. on that leg, then I think that's where that's, that's enough. You don't need to do any more than that. Yeah. It's a really interesting point, actually, that. Um, you know, sometimes they can be lame and you think, but, but why are they so depressed? Why are they so down? And obviously that is really painful. But if they do have a toothache or they have an ulcer or, or something else going on, um, automatically the, some people, and automat I do this sometimes as well, when you see somebody is coming in and they say in pain or limping on the front right or something like that, you think, okay, fine, I'm going to look at this. I know what I'm kind of know what I'm watching for, what I'm looking for. But nobody's even thought to look in the mouth, and that can contribute, can't it? You know yourself when you've got a toothache or earache or something like that. Yeah. It makes the situation ten times worse, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Yeah. Really interesting. Actually, I hadn't even thought about that about saying it. Um. And do you uh, then like to follow up? Obviously, you then get back in contact with the vets uh, after that and discuss what you're going to do. Do you? Do you find that you are changing the plans quite a lot when you see these animals or are you just adding or making suggestions to lifestyle changes? What would you say you most commonly, how do you com commonly manage it altogether? Um, I think the pain, pain management in, in general practice is heaps better than it was 10 years ago. It's come on a yeah. long way, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's very rarely am I doing any major changes. Most of the time it's tweaks. Um, and if it's adding other drugs in, then I'll usually discuss it with the referring vet first. Right. Um, we come to a conclusion on that. And and then assessing as well. That's the other thing. So you need to plan treatment. You need to enable treatment. Um, and then you need to re evaluate and then also review. And there's no yeah. point in just saying, right, that's, that's where you're on and off you go. So yeah. assessment, pain assessment um, is has come on a long way now as well. Different pain assessment uh, questionnaires. Yeah, definitely. And how long do you normally, if you are making a change, and um, I would have. I think it's sensible. I think you've said previously about um, or discussed before, um, make one change because obviously if you do too much altogether, you don't yeah. know what's making a difference. So how long would you normally suggest waiting and monitoring after you make a change to see if you feel like it's making a difference? I think most of the drugs that I'd be adding in, we'd be looking for uh, sometimes to get an immediate response, um, hmm. generally looking for about four or five weeks. Okay. Before yeah. I decide on that anything else in and uh, check that it suits the animal and make sure there's no side effects. Yeah, it can be frustrating, kind of, because you just you kind of want a quick fix. Everyone wants a quick fix, but there is no, there's no, no there's quick no fix. Bullet. No. no. And the other thing is, I've just remembered, I, I've got post-it notes all around here. No <laughs> dogs <from> manual. No. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> no, it's very true. So just because something works well for that one does not yeah. mean that it's going to work amazingly for somebody else. And equally, yeah. sometimes uh, dogs will can tolerate a much higher dose, and other dogs they're fast asleep after one tablet. You know, so you have to yeah. adjust the, the doses for each individual animal. So, yeah. yeah. So then, do you when you um, when you assess them afterwards? Do you send owners home with homework? Do you kind of give them little things to look out for? Do they have a diary that they need to keep or anything like that? Uh, diaries are, are a good thing, I think. Probably just good day, bad day, indifferent day, and just keep a note on the kitchen calendar. That's probably enough to be doing at home. Um, yeah. There's also Vetmetrica, the, the Vetmetrica assessment tool is something I use. It depends on which dogs, yeah. but we, we've got quite a few dogs on that now. And that's something that they can complete at home. Um, yes. Rather than coming into the consulting room or not at the moment, uh, as in yeah. the situation where we are. Yeah. Uh, or having to fill it in in the car whilst I'm looking at their dog. Yeah. They can actually do these things at home and it's a much more accurate and they can discuss it as well. That's the other thing. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard quite a lot. A lot of people are starting to use that, I think, aren't they? The Vetmetrica. Yeah. And, and it's a really useful tool, definitely. And I know uh, with CAM, if anyone hasn't looked at the website or isn't familiar with the website there are loads of um, resources free resources that you can download and use and there is exactly what you just said a good day bad day diary which is yeah. just you know, laid out so just print that out and put it on your fridge or on the side and just fill that in every day and 
and then it's a good thing uh, and I like seeing those because then you know whether actually what you're doing are you going to give it more time or are we going to have to change things because it's not working so yeah it's really useful to have that isn't it I well I find it is anyway yeah. I suppose the other thing, another point on that, actually, listening, as you were saying then, is looking at after you've done a treatment and deciding whether it's helping or not. Mm. I don't often, but the idea is to match up pain mechanisms with, with drugs. Uh, so you're actually targeting different pain mechanisms in, in the animal. So rather than sort of put one drug in and then take it out, um, I will use drugs which will, which will address certain pain mechanisms. And then if there's no great response, I'll add another drug further up the, the pain pathway. Yeah. So, and then we just twiddle the dials until we find something that suits each individual. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Twiddle the dials. Yeah. Yes. It is like that, though. It's tweaking it. And also, it's not, um, you can't always completely fix things, can you? So you're, what you're looking at, I suppose, is this is why it's really useful to keep a record or use Vetmetrica. Um, because you're not going to, in a lot of cases, you're not at the end of the day going to have a dog that is never lame, is never showing any signs of pain, are you? You just no. want one that is better than it was before yeah. you change yeah. things. So we're, it's we're, we're just going through an exercise at the moment, doing the redoing my um, web page and and looking at video examples of before and after. And oh yeah, obviously you pick out the ones that do extremely well, but but it can. You can get some from very very good results. Yeah, good. yeah. Not all, unfortunately. But, uh... And so, what do you do? You discuss a lot of because at um, canine arthritis management, we 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 encourage people to look at yes, look at drugs, speak to your vets, um, but also look at lifestyle and, and how you can change that. Because it is, we always say about this. You know, it's a multimodal approach, isn't it? That you need to take. To manage these cases, yeah. yeah. And so, what kind of lifestyle changes do you specifically talk about? Which ones do you think make the the biggest difference for these dogs? Um, I've spoken to Hannah before, and uh, we and I we we're in agreement that probably the biggest thing is slippery floors. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if even simple things like going to the carpet off cut shop and just getting a square yard of carpet to put underneath the dog's bowl. <laughs> So when they're eating or drinking, that the the front legs don't slide out on a you know on a kitchen yeah. tile floor or lino floor. So look yeah. at that. Um, all the all my patients get advised to go to the camp website and have Brilliant. a look through. And also yeah. the book uh, No Walks No Worries. Have you come across that? I have heard of it. Yes. Yeah. I haven't actually looked at it. I'll be honest. But yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's brilliant. There's it's about ninety odd pages. Uh, nothing is rocket science. When you read it, you, you wouldn't ever say, oh, I wish I'd thought about that. It's all common sense, but it's all yes. there in place. And, yeah. Um, how, to, how to keep the dog's mind busy when its horizons have shrunk. Yeah, yeah. What what kind of exercises do you recommend people are doing? What Do you, do you find that a lot of people come in, because I find this quite a bit, that people come in and they want to continue doing the same exercise levels that they've been doing, but it is making the, the dog lame. Do you have any, I guess you have to kind of tailor it to every case, don't you really? Yeah. But I do you I've find that, that a lot of arthritic dogs are still being over-exercised? You do have to manage expectations. Um, and there was one uh, chap who wasn't very happy with, with the way that the, the dog's pain management was going. So I asked, well, why is that? And, and uh, it was doing a, six mile run with him and before it was able to cope and now it couldn't and i said well i couldn't do a six mile run uh, no it's, it's managing expectations the interesting thing was um i read an article this afternoon about uh, pain management in people and yeah. the fact that exercise is pain relieving yeah and it's a counterintuitive thing but yeah. in people for example if you exercise until you are exhausted it causes more pain. But if you have mm -hmm. regular shorts, which is what, what you advise your clients and I do mine, mm -hmm. regular short walks are better than, than doing a, a great long walk. A six mile hike. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. And definitely. If the dog's lame after a mile, then do three quarters of a mile. But yeah. Um, and every day is going to be different. So some days they might be able to do more, but if they're painful, then you just have to accept that they can't and Yes. Tweak it every day. Yeah. How 
um, when you're talking about your approaches to pain management, how how do you feel the complementary therapies fit in with that? So your physio, hydro, acupuncture, do you do you use a lot of those? Do you talk about a lot of those? Yeah, um, every every dog will be offered uh, physiotherapy, and and we I work very closely with physios in in all three centres actually. Um, our, our main goal, really, I suppose, is to get the pain under control to the point where they can actually benefit from physiotherapy. Yeah. Some some dogs get referred into the physios, and they look at them and they're too sore, and they'll send them to me to get the pain under control. So it's we're both in the same building, and um, it's it's two way traffic. So pain pain and physiotherapy go hand in glove. Um, yeah. I do a fair bit of acupuncture with most dogs. It's very good for and cats as well. Um, mm -hmm wasn't sure how cats would cope with it but they they do very well not quite as well as the dogs would you agree i've had a uh, few failures with cats yeah i suppose it's more plus or minus yeah but you, yeah. Do, get, you do get you get some cats and it's extraordinary how they, they look as though they've been in a trance hypnotized yeah yeah totally yeah but but um, acupuncture is a very use. It's not it's not magic, um, as we we spoke about this earlier. It's not magic. Mm -hmm. It does help with muscle pain, and it also helps with the altering the, the abnormal processing of pain in the spinal cord. So it's a useful it's a useful tool. Yeah, on top of everything else. But I think um, also just going back to what you were saying about the physio, um, that's a really important thing because I've had people come in and and we start to talk about arthritis and um they meet some people will have heard about physio and they know that for people physio is, is such a huge thing to get to maintain muscles and and improve especially after surgeries and that kind of thing um but it's useful to to just reiterate that it's not a good thing to rush into physio because actually it could then have a bad well not bad effects but the dog may become to come to resent it because they're still too painful to do it so yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, that's quite a good point actually, because I think even I sometimes probably rush into advising that um, a little bit too quickly. And and then, what do you suggest? Uh, do you see a lot of overweight arthritic dogs? Yeah, I mean that's uh, well, actually, no. To be fair, no. I think a lot of people are more aware of it now. Um, a lot of owners are more aware of it, and vets for sure are very much aware of it and they're, they're yeah. giving advice to their owners already um i've got another post-it note written down here food is medicine okay uh, yeah discuss but, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't want to talk about specific brands but the, there's yeah. a couple i don't really mind which one it is but uh, right. you'll be aware of them i i do recommend well first off ration reduction if that yeah. doesn't work, that would weigh the dog and it hasn't lost weight then i suggest they go and see the practice and uh, buy the food and get advice from the vet nurse about you know proper feeding rates and that sort of thing yeah because so just talking about using one of the joint diets yeah, and joint or, the, or calorie reduction yeah yeah okay yeah because yeah and um, and i find it quite difficult to to talk to people about weight sometimes um and i think it's it is quite a tricky thing to discuss especially um you know with the older ones with the old dogs because they are arthritic and they haven't been doing so much exercise and probably if they feel a bit depressed sometimes you treat them so they end up then yeah. putting on the weight um and actually more than anything i guess even more than some of the anti-inflammatories and painkillers the weight loss is going to be the biggest thing isn't it Absolutely. It's first on my list. When I, I'm, in my reports, it starts with treatment. This is the reports mm -hmm. of the owner and the vet. The first thing is weight. Okay. About drugs. Uh, right. And as you know, it's not just wear and tear. Um, fat hormones also increase the rate of cartilage destruction in the joint. So yeah. it's a double whammy. Yeah. And it's very difficult. It is difficult when it when you you just describe these old. Um, older arthritic dogs whose exercise has got less and less their mm. muscle mass probably got less and less yes so their sort of resting metabolism is slower or yeah. calories and it is very very difficult but yeah. i do encourage owners even if you get that first kilogram off all of a sudden you find that the dog has got a weight off his shoulders and then so instead of being a vicious circle it becomes a virtuous circle yeah 
lose more weight, yeah. become more active, and then all of a sudden the weight loss follows. Just follows. Yeah, it's true. It's true. It's just getting started, isn't it? And yeah. and everyone agreeing to do it because you can be told something, but actually it, it's you're not going to do it unless you really believe it's going to help. So if a pain specialist is saying that weight loss is the first thing to do, then that just shows how important it is that we do we do um, get onto that quite quickly. So somebody just, uh, Louise has just commented here that it sounds like her with Fat Club. So once you stick at it and then it will just, you know, it continues once you, yes. once you start. It's a bit um, like you, you can put the gym bag in the boot of the car, but it only really helps if you take the gym bag out <laughs> of the gym. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, if you're using it. Um, we have got another question here about the physio that I'm just going to bring up here. So um, Louise has also written here, is it an idea to have maybe annual top-ups of physio after elbow dysplasia surgery at six months old um, when they responded well to physio after surgery? I'm just bringing this up now while we were talking about the, the physio. Yeah, I, I, I would be guided by the physio. Um... I, I do what they tell me. Uh, they're very <laughs> good. Uh, yeah, um, I suppose to answer the question without being flippant, sorry, um, to answer the question, it's a very, very good point, is does the dog need more pain relief as, you know, because it's, uh, was it a year, a year old, that, that dog? Six months at um, at the time of the surgery. Um, I don't know, Louise, if it, how is how's your dog doing now after the elbow surgery? Um, if you can pop that down there as well. Um, procedures it could have had it could have had an ulnar ostectomy or a coronoid okay but i guess that kind of thing any dog that's had any sort of surgery at a young age is going to be more likely to develop arthritis aren't they um not necessarily more likely to but it, it will it will like if it's had surgery on the joint i think you'd have to expect there would be arthritis there so the, yeah. the first thing would be probably get it assessed make sure there's no pain requirement there or requirement for increased pain relief um, yeah and then have a word with your vet and see whether whether physio might be indicated yeah so she's just saying he's now 18 months old so yeah i guess like fergus said you know go back to the vet and just see um see see what they think see see how he's getting on um so the when we're talking about uh, the complementary therapies we've got another question here from laura um, just asking about, do you use or advise electrotherapy such as TENS or PMF, etc., for pain relief? Um, I don't have any experience of that. Um, I know the physios, well, I do electroacupuncture when I do elect when I do acupuncture, I do electro electroacupuncture, which is, yeah. you know, has a similar effect to TENS, but it probably lasts longer, I think, with TENS, once you take the machines off, the, the effect is probably gone. It stops. Yeah. yeah. I can um, only speak through personal experience with that and having a TENS machine, I found really uncomfortable. <laughs> um, but I would agree that as soon as it was switched off, there wasn't any sort of lasting, I mean, you could feel feel it doing something, but afterwards it was, that was it. it was just yeah. helping at the time, definitely. So, um, um, so with the electroacupuncture, they, they tolerate that okay as on top of just having the needles? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so weight management and, and lifestyle changes. Um, we've also got a question here from, uh, no, that wasn't the one I wanted to get. Um, here we go, from Karen. Um, about, uh, can you please advise on heat mats, etc.? Would you say that's more of a physio type thing to talk about or do you? Uh, yeah, possibly. I, I do ask people to, well, it depends on, on the dog, quite often, the well as you know you'll uh with dogs that have got problems in their elbows have often got sore backs as well and it could yeah. just be altered gait it may not be anything wrong with the back mm. so that, that's probably more muscle tenderness uh, muscle pain and so i'll often ask people to get these microwave you know the bean bags that go around your neck yeah yeah and try that and see whether that well first of all make sure it's not too hot and make sure yeah. it's and the inside of your arm but uh try it sometimes dogs find it very soothing yeah sometimes they see the bean bag coming out of the microwave and they they leave the room you know they don't okay. with it. so each individual would be um so to answer yeah. karen's question 
heat mats or, or that type of thing. I think wouldn't spend a lot of money on it to start with. Try a hot water bottle or something cheap. See and just see if they react well to yeah. it. And if they're yeah. really keen on it, then, um, then by all means. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, uh, the, um, uh, Louise has just written that her her dog with the elbow dysplasia had an ulnar osteotomy and the elbow job on both legs. Okay. So, yeah. Keep, well, keep talking to your vet, basically. And if you feel that there are pain issues, then um, definitely go and see someone like Fergus and, and get it managed earlier rather than leave it till it's a problem, I guess. Um, uh, oh, then Karen's just written that her, she said, um, my girl goes mad for her hot water bottle. So that's good. So maybe invest in a, a, a more expensive um, bean bag that you can pop in the in the microwave as well. And um, so just, just getting back to the cases that you see, um, we were talking about if you do make changes or if you discuss what you're going to do, you normally would say give it a good four or five weeks to, to see if there's any any changes after that. Um, and then do you like to see your clients back? Do they sort of email reports into you at that point? Do you How do you go on with subsequent checkups? Uh, the ones, yeah, if they're near enough to see conveniently, then then I'll, I'll see them again sometimes weekly, sometimes fortnightly, sometimes monthly. Um, okay. So old dogs it's every six weeks um it really depends there's some some dogs travel a long way for, you know from south scotland um it's too far to to, to deal with time really come back so then i'll just have a word with the vets uh, at their referring vet and we discuss that yeah we were talking earlier about using the video consults as well which i guess would come into play for those rechecks where you feel like you just want to have a chat and rather than physically examine them Yes. Or you could still watch a video of them walking and, and have a ch have a chat through a video consult, couldn't you? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they get, they're getting more and more popular. Um, so uh, just one of the things that I wanted to ask was about when you when you see these animals. So from a vet perspective, um, what do you wish that vets would do? Just for any other vets that are watching right now, is there one thing that you would say to us that wish they'd tried this or done this before they referred to me or information that I wish they'd given me when I'm about to see this animal? Not really, no. Okay. no I think uh, I, I still do some first opinion work and I know it's, it's very, very different to um, when I see animals at the referral centres. Yeah. And it's... Uh, you know, there's a lot less. There's a lot more time pressure in first opinion work. Uh, no, I, I think I think generally, I think pain management as as a profession, I think the vets are doing a grand job. Much better than they were, anyway. Like you said, oh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And do you use? Uh, obviously, you were talking about Vetmetrica earlier on, which is the the online tool to for people for owners to kind of assess how their their dog is doing. Yeah. Um, are there any sort of online resources that you would, that are more free, I suppose, um, that you would advise um, clients or dog owners to have a look at in addition to the Canine Arthritis Management website, of course? Uh, um, is there anything else that you <laughs> that you go to, sort of websites that you like to look at? or? Um, I think in terms of assessment, the, the problem is that it doesn't really work if people are looking at the... Um, assessment before they before they have, yeah if they know what the answers are then you can end up with you know it's human nature to want to give the answers that make something look the way they want it to look yeah of course rather than do that so i i think probably i mean it depends i use a variety of of uh questionnaires apart from vetmetrica um and um i, I think just have a look at the cam website things yeah. like that. we're talking about good days bad days the quality of life questionnaires those sort of things yeah, yeah. Fine. And the website also has a lot of tips um, and again, free resources about lifestyle changes. And, and when talking earlier about the heat mats, um, there are lots of things in the, the cam shop as well. So dog beds, great beds that you can use for arthritic dogs and those heat mats and that kind of thing. So if you are looking for something, then have a look on there or get in touch and um, she'll be able to advise on on where to get that kind of thing. Um, I've just got a message here. I'm not sure if you know this lady, Louisa. Fergus is great and does an amazing job. 
Hi, Louisa. <laughs> <laughs> That's always always a nice one to have up there. Um, so if we have any more questions, please do pop them in there. Um, oh, here we go. There's another one for you here. Evening, Fergus. Boson is very chilled oh, after his course. session with you today. <laughs> Are we able to share what um, did Fergus have, have said? Boson have some acupuncture today, by any chance? Uh, he did. Yep, he did, and he's, he was snoring through the whole thing. Was he? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of dog is Boson? Uh, he's a Newfoundland. Oh wow! Okay. Uh, um, oh, cool. Yeah, but that, that's uh, you, you mentioned about reaction to acupuncture. The, you know, some especially with. Sometimes people are anxious about how the dog would would react, especially if, if the owners haven't had acupuncture themselves. It's an un, yeah. it's quite reasonably it's an unknown. I mean, how would you? Totally. Know? Um, and it's quite surprising sometimes to people just how well their their dogs tolerate it. Um, yeah. To the point where they start snoring. Yeah. I do find that people are are really surprised. They say, "Oh no, he's definitely not going to tolerate this." Yeah, I mean, you can try it, but I'm pretty sure that he's going to go crazy. And actually, yeah, they fall asleep, or or a lot of some of them don't fall asleep. I find at the practice, but then the following week, or when I see them again, they say, "Gosh, he slept so well last night. He was really chilled out after the acupuncture." Um, there, just are, there are some dogs that it's just not for them, though. It Absolutely, there are some dogs. It's just we just have to abandon. And uh, it's not going to work. Yeah, yeah, and uh, some dogs do still tolerate it, but it and it, they they go through the process okay. But it's actually that's the other thing that can't always help them, can it? So some of them don't tolerate it, but also some do tolerate it, and it's not really not really doing something. But it's always something um, in addition to try. Um, I'm just going to have a little look here. Um, yes, definitely. So we've got a question from Joe. Oh no, Lizzie's chilled. Well, it's another one. Lizzie has chilled out after today's session. I'm showing her Ramsey. Um, there's another one here from Joe. Um, my dog has bad arthritis in his elbow, lack of cartilage, and he's on a lot of painkillers. Um, would acupuncture help? Um, I think in that situation, I would chat to your vet and um, would you say the same? Yeah. And then um, depending on what part of the country you're in, you know, if you if they do you, if you something you want to try then um chat to your vet and i'm sure a vet could get in touch with fergus or or a local specialist if if necessary yeah. there's there's a lot of, there's a lot of people now across country yeah 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 but i think if there's if things aren't going well and despite being on appropriate drugs and sometimes it's the dose that is changing uh yeah. weight uh, yes look at that and look at the whole big picture and yeah. uh, if, your, if your vet's still concerned, then um, she could, or he or she can make the referral. Get in touch. Yeah, because I've been saying, like, like you said before, acupuncture is not sort of a miracle type thing. It's just part of the multimodal approach. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've got another question here from Jane. Uh, would a pain specialist see my boy and would it benefit him as he has numerous problems, chronic pain syndrome, brain degeneration and paradoxical pseudomyotonia as my own vet does not really understand his condition and he's only now under the neurologist? Are you happy to answer that? Uh, I have not heard of paradoxical pseudomyotonia myself. Uh, I'm glad you said that because I was thinking, okay, yeah, okay. Uh, it sounds, oh, that's a shame. Um, yeah, I don't know how, how old the dog is. Is that him in the picture, the beagle? Uh, we'll see if Jane will let us know. Um, but I would say if, if you're worried about pain and you don't think it's well managed, chat to your vet and... Yeah. I mean, if any vet is anything like me, if they if they're thinking that this is too complicated for them, then they'd be very happy to refer you to a pain specialist if that's what they felt All would the be the right to do. Always consult someone and um, get some input there as well. You know. Yeah, because when you've got other conditions going on, yeah. yeah, you need to work with each of those specialists, really, don't you? To to really um, get on top of it. Um, Jane's written he's a cocky, he's a working cocker, and he's now eight. All right, okay. Um, got another question from Louise saying, can I ask Fergus, what are your thoughts on homeopathic treatments? Uh, well, I don't use it myself. Um, I, don't, I don't really have an opinion one way or the other, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, again, I, I mean, I don't use them. Um, 
I know some people swear by it, some people don't. I think it's a very individual thing. Again, speak to your vet probably about what they, if it's something you want to look at, then there will be people that you can talk to about it, definitely. But I don't really know enough about it either. And there was just another thing up here that I think. Has anyone asked about food supplements? They haven't. Um, but I will ask you about that. I'm just going to show you this one. I think this um, from Canine Arthritis Management Professional is probably Hannah. Um, I was listening to Brian McKenna's SkeptVet and he is adamant there's still not, oh, what was that about? Still not enough evidence. Sorry, I, I didn't read all of that because I'm not sure enough evidence about what. Um, have you seen the Vet Lessons pain stuff? Ah, yes. Have you heard about Vet Lessons? uh that's is that colin whiting um or uh oh, possibly or ah, i'm trying to think of his name now um no, colin, think uh, mike, mike, farrell. mike farrell that's it mike i'm trying to think of the surname yes have you heard about that uh i have and i've not read it okay fine <laughs> <Bye. laughs> um oh so what what um where you, when we were saying up here about the other one i was listening to brian mckenna skeptic that and he's adamant there's still there isn't enough evidence and that's about acupuncture all right Do, are you any views about evidence base i mean, I, I guess it's just experience and how it works for you i suppose uh yes um i th i think also the um oh, i have to be careful what i say because you know whatever you say can be uh not not twisted around but interpreted <laughs> I, I think it would be very difficult to design a trial, a trial where you treated a dog but didn't treat it or, or had a placebo effect as well, um, yeah. a placebo arm rather, uh, and then comparing one with the other. Yeah. I think the anyone who's it's particularly people who've had acupuncture, um, they can feel the benefit from it, and not all people do. So. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, if they do, then they're, they're kind of already on board, aren't they, for their own pet then? And, and as we've said before, I, there's there's hardly, I don't think there's, any, there's no dogs that I treat at the moment who are on acupuncture alone. Um, so yeah. it's a useful adjunct too. It's not replacing frontline drugs um, and evidence-based stuff. Yeah, it's never the first thing you say, right, okay, you've got an arthritic dog, we're going to do, we're going to start you off on a non-steroid or anti-inflammatory, and we're also going to start acupuncture today. It just wouldn't, it's just not the way you go about it. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yes, with the joint supplements, we do now have a question here. Um, my boy is on Nutriprim Plus. The jury seems divided on supplements. What are your thoughts? Um, the, there's... Uh... The, the problem is that there is no evidence one way. Well, the only stuff for which there is evidence is omega-3 fatty acids. Yeah. That's it. That's the only yeah. stuff. That, uh, and that hasn't really changed. Um, mm. One of the problems is that you'll have clients, and so do I, who swear that one um, food supplement helps their dog and the other one doesn't. And this is yeah. also reflected in the human trials as well, where, where sometimes it will come out that it shows that it works for shoulder arthritis and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. One of the problems is that it's so expensive to design a trial that um, if they were to, to set the trial up, if you know, if, if you set a trial up and, and spent a million pounds on it showing that one particular component worked, then uh, I could come along and start selling stuff and say, well, look, you use your evidence and, and uh, gain the benefit from it. Yeah. Well, I think that's that's part of the reason that there's there's very little evidence there. And also the other thing is that a lot of these products are not just glucosamine and chondroitin. Mm. There's other things in with them. Yeah. And so which which is actually having the effect. So Yeah, true. I, yeah. I would, my general I I don't often recommend food su food supplements if people want to buy them that the dog or the cat yeah. and then fine. But you'd rather, if you've got one pot of money and it's not going to cover everything, you'd rather come, you know, go for a non-steroidal rather than a, a food supplement. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And, and diet food. Yes. Yes. Make sure it's the right food and the right amount of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, we've got one here. So Louise has written, I personally feel supplements are an absolute mind-blowing area. Yeah, absolutely. And but there's so many different types and different strengths. And her husband gets the same, but at a larger dose. 
So, well, if he's doing well on it, then you know, give it a go. It's, it's yeah. fine. Um, and then we've got a question just here from Kate saying, my dog is having acupuncture without medication currently. Is that not right? It's not that it's not right. Um, I mean, how would you sort of go about addressing that question? Um, I wouldn't say it's not right. There are some dogs for whom they, they just simply can't take other, med other medicines. I've, I have had patients like that. And mm. um, they just can't uh, with pancreatitis, kidney problems, whatever. They just can't. Uh, bowel, bowel issues. They, they, none of the usual drugs will, will help them. Or, yeah. or at least they can't tolerate the usual drugs. In that case, that would be quite reasonable. Yeah. Well, this is a decision that each vet will be making on their own. It's not uh, you mm. and I can't make decisions for them on no the animal, so. and it's certainly not going to be doing any harm and and yeah i mean it's always it's it's like you say something to discuss but no it's it's absolutely fine to be doing that yeah um so if um i'm just trying to think for any more up here that we've missed I don't want anyone to if there are any questions i will go through these and if there are if there's anything that we haven't replied or addressed then i will later comment on it um but is there anything else? Is there your top tips are going to be for uh, any arthritic dog? What are your three top tips? I think I know one of them is we can count weight management as one of those. Yeah, I think so. Um, the other thing is, I think by the time they come to see me, um, again, first opinion work, we, you can use uh, anti-inflammatories as a, uh, strategically. So if the dog's having a bad day, then by all means treat it for two or three days um, and then stop. That's that's quite reasonable. Okay. When they, come, when they come to see, that's my personal view. Yeah. Once it gets to the point where I'm seeing them, my they, I always like them to be on anti-inflammatories full time. So yeah. uh, that would be the so daily daily treat. Don't let pain get away because once once pain gets away, and you end up with a chronic. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with, with chronic pain. Uh, well, so escalating, it gets more, more and more difficult to to get it under control afterwards. Yeah, yeah. So that was your second tip, and then um, and managing exercise. I think from what I read today, it just it's it's from the human field, and we can't always correlate that with with the, the veterinary field. But mm. I think regular small amounts of exercise, not to the point where you know, not to the point where the dog becomes lame. You know, take taper it for each individual animal, and mm -hmm. make sure they get um, more more frequent, shorter walks. And also, walking on grass is going to be better for them than than um, possibly walking on a road or or a cobbly cobbly street, for example. Yeah, just thinking about where you take them. Yeah, to, have a look at yeah. what they're walking on. And walking through forests, uh, you might think it's nice soft mud. It probably is, but if there's a lot of tree roots there, then yeah. that could tipping them over and, and put extra stress on the on the joint things to stumble over yeah um so i've just got a couple more that we just go is it possible to overdo with supplements again i would just if you're using a supplement i would use it as directed really and only choose one supplement you don't want to be using uh, many and and i would say that the one with the omega-3s is is the only one that's really proven to be um useful in in these arthritic dogs um just got one there as well sorry we'll just do a couple more my my vet started my dog on prevacox for oa in his knees how long is it safe to use these drugs for and he's an 11 year old pointer cross okay um right it, as long as there's no other problems going on which your vet will have checked already um long term well if 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 the dog sorry if a dog is starting off on anti-inflammatories in first opinion practice, I would usually then schedule a blood sample to check liver and kidney function three or four weeks later before we give long-term uh, treatment. Yeah. So that would be something to look for is is get a blood sample checked after the dog's been on it for a, for a few weeks um, or before, depending on, on, on the, the approach of the, of the vet and with the dog's presenting signs. In terms of safety, uh, length of treatment does not affect the, the safety of these drugs. Yeah. If, if an animal has reactions to it, and I don't know what your experience is, but do, do you see many reactions to anti-inflammatory? Not, not really. I, and there are sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, that when we do those checkup bloods, 
that it flags something up. They haven't been showing any symptoms. We're not going to be changing anything because of any signs in the dog, but there may be something on the bloods that make us think, well, yeah, we are going to change things a little bit before you then develop any problems. Yes. Um, but no, so there are some dogs that have been on, so some, going back to what you were saying earlier, you know, some of these dogs that have hip dysplasia that are showing pain at a very early age, some of them do end up being on pain relief for their whole life, don't they? They do, yeah. And they tolerate it fine. And it's as long as you're checking and monitoring, there is no reason why they can't really stay on them, is there? Uh, no, there's not, no. And mm -hmm. and again, I would use, if a dog needs it, I would use it at the correct dose. Yeah. If, yeah. if it's still just occasional use and uh, just when it's having sore days, then that's another matter. But I think if it, once they start becoming a frequent, uh, once treatments become more frequent, then I would prefer them to be daily. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, don't again, discuss it. Make sure that you're happy with the um, treatment plan and how you're going to manage it um, and get him checked regularly. Um, but he's fine to stay on that for as long as he needs it. Um, and if there are problems, then obviously you, you'll be discussing that and changing it. So I think I'm going to wrap it up there and I'm going to have a look at the rest of these questions um, uh, later and, and answer them. Um, but thank you so much for your time, Fergus. And um, if there are any, no worries, thank you. If there are any questions um, afterwards, please do comment or, or get in touch. So I hope you all have an enjoyable rest of your evening and we will see you soon.